Yeah. Well, thanks very much. And thanks so much, everybody, for coming. L give me a sign if, it's not, if I'm not talking loudly enough or anything like that or whatever. That's, and break in if you really feel the urge to do so. Now, I'm going to tell you three stories from the book I wrote, The Dark Net. But I want to tell you first why I wrote this book, why I decided to spend really a year of my life um, trawling around, crawling around the sort of most shocking hidden parts of the internet. And the reason was this. So over the last three, four years in my work at Demos, but also at the Telegraph where I write sometimes on technology, I'd always felt like I was constantly hearing stories about terrible things happening on the net. Illegal pornography, drugs being bought and sold, internet trolls and bullies, neo-Nazis, Islamic State, and so on. But what I always felt about that was that I was never really getting the full picture. It was always a flash of a story. And I wanted to understand, so I suppose, the human, the social, the subcultural reasons why people were getting themselves into these internet subcultures. What was driving them there? And I suppose more broadly, what are the extremities to which we will go? Because it really is all of us. We will go when under the conditions of real or perceived anonymity. And this is increasingly an important question because of how important internet privacy is becoming to so many of us and the measures that many of us are taking to stay hidden and secret online what can happen under those conditions? But I also wanted to do something else. I wanted to go and meet the people in person who were the internet trolls, the neo-Nazis, the people that were convicted of illegal possession, illegal pornography, the people that were making uh, pornography from home, the people that were in pro-anorexia and pro-suicide sites and forums, the people that were building apps for Bitcoin. Who were these people? What are they actually like in real life? And so that's what I did. So over the course of the last, yeah, I mean, it was about a year I did this for, I found these hidden internet subcultures. I immersed myself in them as far as possible legally, sometimes slightly beyond that too, and went and met the people in real life. And that journey, I suppose, didn't just take place on tour. I'll tell you what I mean by that in a second, but on the what's increasingly called the dark net, which is an encrypted part of the internet. Some of it did, but some of it was in Facebook groups, and it was on normal chat rooms, and it was on Twitter, and it was anywhere else. So this isn't just about Tor, but I am going to tell you about Tor and what I did on Tor. And this story, the stories that I'm going to tell you, well, they're about... They're about sex, drugs, but not rock and roll, unfortunately. Sorry. They're sex, drugs, and neo-Nazis. So <laughs> it's nearly as good. Um, and I'm going to start with the drugs. So uh, I, I always ask this question. I did a talk to a load of police officers about this a couple of weeks ago. And the question is, has anyone ever bought drugs off the Silk Road website? Yeah, there's always one person who has. Yeah. <laughs> no one put their hand up when I was speaking to the police, but never mind. Well, they did laugh. I reckon some of them probably had. Um, so I did, and I will tell you how and why it's interesting to do it. Um, and it's not the reason that you think it is. And this is a story that does take place on the tour network. So what is TOR? Well, back in the 90s, US naval intelligence wanted to build a web browser that would obscure the IP address of their agents, the, their people, the people that you know, they obviously had people working for them that wanted to go on the net and go into chat rooms and all the rest without anybody else knowing where they were. And of course, you will all know that when you give away, when you browse the web with a normal browser, you give away your IP address either to the person that's at the other end, the website, the domain name holder, whoever, or indeed to third parties that are trying to trace you and track you and see what you're doing online. So the US Naval Intelligence came up with an ingenious piece of engineering, which they called the Onion Router. And it worked something like this. They, uh, you would type in an address for a website you wanted to go to and it would be wrapped 
with three layers of encryption. So anyone trying to listen in couldn't really work out what website you were trying to get to. You'd fire that request off to another computer that was using the Tor protocol, which would unwrap the first layer of encryption, but no more, and would then send it off to another node on the network that was using the Tor protocol that would unwrap the second layer of encryption, do it again for the final hop, and then to the website. And what this meant was that no one at the end or at the beginning knew the other bits of the, the hops, knew the other nodes, and essentially it was very, very difficult, if not impossible, to be able to know what a person using the Tor browser, that's what they built it in as a browser, was doing online at any time. Unbelievable piece of engineering. The only problem with this was, it's a unique protocol, which meant that US Naval Intelligence worked out, if we're the only people using this, uh, they're all going to know it's us. So what's the point? Complete waste of time. <laughs> it's actually worse. <laughs> they can be certain it's us. <laughs> so they decided to open source this project, make this available to everybody and anybody. And then they thought we could swim with the other fishes and we'd get, you know, we'd hide in the crowd. So they open sourced the protocol and the browser, and it was taken up by civil liberties activists, democratic activists, who realised the value of this for internet privacy, especially in dangerous parts of the world, but also as a way to circumnavigate censorship. Because when you bounce your request for a website off these three nodes, the final node, the final IP address that it comes out of is not in the country that you're based in. So you can get around some of this sort of state level or network level censorship. So this is an amazing, amazing piece of kit. And it was picked up and used by lots of civil liberties activists and still is. And this is the Tor browser. Have any of you guys used it? It's a little slow. It's getting faster. It means more than just browsing. It's a bit of a statement when you use it because you really care about internet privacy and internet freedom. Now. A little while later, I'm not actually sure who, somebody realised that you could use the same sort of system to obscure the location of a, of a website as well. And this became known as Tor Hidden Services and shorthand the Darknet. It's something like 30 to 60,000 sites which you access using the Tor browser and which, because it uses the same system, it makes the server where that website is hosted almost impossible to find, so you don't know the physical location of the site, so you can't really censor it, you can't really remove it. If you're an authority, it's there, but you don't know where in the world you need to go to to try and get it offline. So you've got this network of sites which is more or less impossible to censor or remove, and people going on there with a browser that means you can't be found either. Well, so you can imagine what this creates. It creates one of the most interesting, exciting, terrifying parts of the net. Because it's somewhere where anybody with something to hide is going to go. So there you will find the good, the bad and the ugly, cheek by jowl. You will find illegal pornography. You will find whistleblower sites. The New Yorker even has a site on the dark net for whistleblowers. There's a lot of rubbish on there as well. Terrible blogs and all sorts of crap. But there is an incredible community of anonymous markets called the Darknet Markets. And that's where I went for my drug deal. And I'll tell you how it works. So you've signed on. I'm just going to, speaking of drugs, I'm just going to have a quick swig. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. So you've got your browser, you've got your Tor browser. And you go on to one of these Darknet Markets. You found the URL. The URLs of these sites, these between 30 and 60,000 sites, finish in dot onion, and they're usually just a string of meaningless characters and I mean numbers and letters, and you very hard to memorize any of them, and they change a lot. But you can find these sites on a number of index sites that guide you towards them, and you get to your Darknet marketplace. It's about 20, 25 in operation at the moment. And I went to the Silk Road 2, that was, my, that was my site of choice. The Silk Road 2 replaced the Silk Road 1, as you can probably guess. Silk Road 1 was shut down by the FBI, and we'll maybe get to that. So the Silk Road 2, and the first thing you notice on signing up to the Silk Road 2 
is how familiar it looks because it looks just like Amazon or eBay. That is to say, thousands of products on offer from hundreds of vendors. When I was there, 13,000 products, mainly drugs, from 900 vendors, a third of which were based in the US, a tenth of which were based in the UK. But you've got your little, you sort of go to checkout, proceed to checkout, little logo, proceed to checkout. How many bitcoins do you have in your wallet? Currency of choice here is, of, is of course, the cryptocurrency. Bitcoin, pseudonymous, not perfect for keeping your location hidden, but pretty damn good. And every product, of course, has a picture, description. Crucially, crucially, how do any of us, when we are faced with the impossible degree of choice that we have on a daily basis, when we go onto Amazon or eBay, decide whether we're going to make a product purchase or not. It's the user reviews, it's the star, it's the star system, I don't know what you call it, the rating system. It's become like such an important currency today because it's the only way we can make decisions when we're faced with such levels of choice. And that is exactly the same on the Silk Road. Which is to say, everybody who uses the product, uses the site, will very, very, almost religiously, afterwards give the product a score out of five and write a review about how good the product was. How good was the purity? Did it arrive on time? Did the vendor, was the vendor polite? Did he, did he respond quickly and promptly to my uh, questions? Whatever you want. But this, this is the secret, the trick, to why these markets work, because they introduce genuine competition and choice into, a, into an industry which is usually, historically, characterised by, of course, cartels and monopolies. Now these marketplaces, they're not only about drugs. With, uh, for, in, in anonymous markets, you can buy and sell anything you want, with a few exceptions, it depends on the site, but you can buy and sell anything you want. And on the Silk Road, in April of last year, when I was doing a lot of my research on there, the number one product on the site in April was fake £20 Tesco vouchers that were being sold, that were being sold for eight quid. Some person was shipping thousands of these things. You know, it was like a couple of months after that, Tesco's uh, sales figures, all their, their annual report was looking really suspect. I was trying to make a link there. But it is mainly the drugs, it's mainly the drugs, of course. And, but this is what it does, this is what it does, this introduction of market competition and choice into the, into the drugs industry, and this is why it's so interesting. It of course shifts everything so vendors are desperately working to keep the customer happy. Let me give you an example. I found among the hundreds a vendor that I thought was good, it's called Drugs Heaven. Looked good, based overseas, uh, free uh, package and delivery on your first order. Brilliant, <laughs> so I'll take that. Money back if you're not happy with what you're getting. I mean, I was thinking this is amazing, it's amazing stuff. So, I emailed Drugs Heaven on the internal emailing system. It's all encrypted, remember. Say, so, dear Drugs Heaven, I am new to this site. I would, own, I would like to... Uh, just buy a very small amount of marijuana, but I don't know which one. Could you please help me? Thanks very much. I didn't use my real name when I signed it off. <laughs> Obviously, no one does. And sure enough, a couple of hours later, dear sir, thank you very much for your inquiry. May I suggest you try the Afghan Kush, whatever it was. It's only this much a gram, has excellent reviews. Do get in touch if you've got any further questions. Best wishes, drugs heaven. <laughs> this, this is what makes the system work. It's the introduction of competition and choice and the fact that there is a mechanism by which you get to decide who is considered by other users to be the best vendor. And this introduction of competition and choice is creating an incredible dynamic, which is what you'd expect. That product quality and choice is always going up and price is always going down. It's what happens in markets, and strangely enough, being on the, of all the places in the world, it was being on this site that made me think, 
bloody hell, markets actually work. They really work. <laughs> Didn't expect to find it there. So, for example, a couple of months ago, so it was after I'd written the book, I saw one vendor, just to give you an example, one vendor who was selling, and I quote, fair trade organic cocaine. <laughs> <laughs> Not joking. That was sourced, says vendor, from... Uh, local Guatemalan farmers, not your Colombian drugs lords or your dodgy coppers or anything like that, Colombian, uh, Guatemalan farmers, not only that, this vendor promised that 20% of any profits made would be reinvested into local education projects in the community. <laughs> How about that? How about that? So I managed to get hold of 120,000 pieces of feedback that had been left on the Silk Road over a three-month period while I was writing the book. Some clever guy had found it, sucked it off the Silk Road site and then dumped it in an obscure forum. 120,000 pieces of feedback. Average score, and I'm not going to go with the average score, 95% of the scores for the drugs are what do you expect? Five stars out of five. That's what happens. Lots of very, very happy dealers out there and buyers. And so as a result of this, creates a very difficult dilemma, I think. And this is actually a theme that runs through the whole of my book, which is the dilemmas, the sort of moral dilemmas that are created when you operate in the conditions of anonymity. Because on the one hand, if you are with a dark net market, an anonymous marketplace like this, drugs, more drugs are more easily available to more people and higher quality and in more variety. Everything we know about drugs consumption suggests that drug consumption will go up under those conditions. I actually heard about recently some people, I think someone had tried to murder their husband by buying some arsen, I can't remember what it was now, some kind of poison that they'd found on the dark net. There's going to be problems with making the supply of drugs. And imagine when it continues to evolve. Imagine. What happens if they start managing to nail, say at the moment, You've got to wait two or three days for your drugs to turn up in the post. Because that's how it works. Put in your, put in your address, which is pretty terrifying. But a lot of people send it to a, they call it a drop address. Which means it's an address where you have access, but you don't live there, and you give a fake name, but you know what name to look out for. That's what most people do. But I, to test the system, I had to get the thing sent to my address. So it's quite terrifying when you do that, because you're thinking, sure, I'm giving my address to a bloody drug dealer. That's not a good call. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, and, and so um, the, 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 what happens when you move from a marketplace like this where you have to wait three days to get your product to one where you can order on the night when it's two o'clock in the morning and it's Saturday and you don't want the party to end? Because that's what these marketplaces will try to do because they are absolutely, they're so competitive, they're constantly evolving, they're constantly innovating, and they're going to be trying to work out how are we going to get, you know, we've got to cut down the delivery times. We need the impulse buyers. That's 70% of the drugs market. How are we going to get them? And they're working on ways to try to do it. They've got an incredibly sophisticated suite of ways of getting around problems with payment. So you pay in Bitcoin, but the problem with Bitcoin, I don't know if any of you use Bitcoin, but the problem with Bitcoin is that it's not actually anonymous. It's pseudonymous. Every transaction is publicly recorded. Which means if you buy Bitcoin with your credit card and then you use those Bitcoin to buy the drugs, it's really easy to trace it right back to you. So they've invented, they realised this was a problem, and they invented all sorts of little micro laundering systems whereby I need to send a Bitcoin to my Silk Road wallet, you need to send a Bitcoin to your mother, we both send one Bitcoin to a central wallet, which then splits our Bitcoins up and then sends them on their way, so they're no longer the same Bitcoin that ends up in each place. Constantly, when you do that three or four times, it is so difficult to trace a Bitcoin transaction back to an individual. They're constantly trying to innovate. So this is the problem. More drugs, more readily available to more people. But on the other hand, of course, there is actually a functioning system that allows people to determine the purity and the quality of the drugs they're taking. And the reason so many people die from overdoses is, of course, because... They don't know the purity, sometimes it's too strong, or it's mixed with a load of shit. And so they're 
overdosing because they got Novocaine or whatever else cut with their drugs, if they're lucky. 11 people died in Glasgow a couple of years ago because their drugs had been cut with something ridiculous, like arsenic or something absurd that had been put into their heroin. That stuff does not happen in the same way on these markets. It's not perfect, but it is a functioning system. What's more, you of course are reducing a lot of the street crime that's related with petty turf wars. So suddenly you've got a dilemma. Is this a good thing for society? Might these markets actually point the direct point towards an alternative model for our war on drugs? Which wouldn't be a war at all, it'd be a functioning marketplace. This is the dilemma, and so this is the dilemma that I faced throughout the book, and it's a dilemma that I'm going to take you now to the sex chapter, which is where I faced another radically different dilemma. Now, yeah, if you wouldn't mind, that'd be good. Yeah, thanks. Mm. Mm. Now, I, when I started writing this book, I'm quite naive. I'd never heard of webcamming. Does anyone here know what web webcamming is? I hadn't. I really hadn't. I re honestly, I didn't. Know, I didn't know. I didn't know. Or like, I tell you what, I did definitely didn't know. I mean, I imagine people might do it. But I definitely didn't know quite how vibrant this community of webcam, webcam girls, mainly girls, was. So let me explain to those of you who might not know, like me. Webcamming is where predominantly young women between 18 and 24 perform sexually explicit acts in their bedrooms for viewers that are watching at home through their screens. It's usually done to uh, sort of a tipping model, so it's a freemium model, it's free to go in and watch, and you pay money in tokens, depending on the site, if you like what you're seeing. That's what webcamming is, essentially. And anyone can do it, you, you can all do it, I could have done it, but there's about 30,000 or so women that are doing it, many of whom are making a pretty damn good living out of it. That's webcamming. Now, I was lucky enough to, to meet and attend the show of probably the UK's top cam girls. Well, they call themselves cam girls. Now, camming is probably the only part of the adult entertainment industry that's actually growing. Growing in terms of popularity and revenue. And I'll explain why that is, because I was staggered by that fact. I'll explain why that is. Now, the girl that I went to see was called Vex. Anyone actually know? <laughs> no, don't worry about that. <laughs> it was called Vex. It's unbelievable. Gorgeous. And she agreed to me. I mean, I spent a lot of time emailing cam girls without much response. <laughs> she is amazingly cool and really nice and replied and agreed to meet me in Leeds. She doesn't live in Leeds, but she lives nearish. And agreed to meet me and say, uh, like, talk me through how it went, how the job went and what she did each day. So I'm chatting with her in this cafe and I'm thinking, the only way this chapter's going to work is if she lets me go into her bedroom when she's doing a show. That's the only way. Otherwise, how am I going to write this chapter? It's not going to be interesting. But I was really nervous. Like, how am I going to bring this up? <laughs> so so I was, I'm sort of building up the courage, thinking, okay, I'm just going to ask, I'm going to ask. And then her boyfriend walks in. I'm like, this is over. I'm going. It's not good, nothing. And then she suggests that I come to her room and watch her perform. I didn't even suggest. She suggested it. She's like, you know what, Jamie? Well, it would be a brilliant idea. Why don't you come to one of my shows? I have a three-girl orgy next week. I was like, I could. I, let me check my... Yes, I am free. I think I can make that. <laughs> uh, so, sure enough, the following week, maybe in a couple of weeks later, I was up at her house. Her boyfriend's downstairs, and three girls on the bed, I'll tell you how it looked exactly, on the bed performing to 5,000 people that were watching this show. 5,000 people. So, basically the way it looked was, here's the, cam here's the computer, and you have on one side, the girls can see their own image, which is what the webcam's looking at, and then down the side there's a chat bar. So people that are watching can chat and make requests and say this, that, or the other. And so this is, this, this is the computer. It's not this big, obviously. It's a normal computer. They're on the bed here. 
and I'm basically sitting here with my notepad and on, my, on a little stool over here. And this show lasted for three hours. Three hours. And that sort of, the interesting thing about that was it made me realise something, that the whole performance was not really about sex at all. Well, it was about sex, that's not true. It was about sex. But it was a lot more than that. It was a social event. It seemed like so many of the people in this room actually knew each other. They were friends with each other. They somehow created a community around her, whereby every time she performed, which was maybe once or twice a week, they'd all get together, go into her room and have a right laugh. And it, and it was really fun. It was really enjoyable. It was really sociable. Now, it takes a lot of creativity to keep three hours <laughs> going for 5,000 people. A lot of creativity. And they are incredibly creative, these girls. So there was three of them. And then before the show started, they're sitting around, and I'm with them, and they're thinking, how are we going to make money here? What are we gonna, what's our strategy? It's like a business. What's our strategy to get the tips? We need the tips. What's our strategy? And so they came up with something called a Kino board. I definitely hadn't heard of a Kino board before. But it's like, a, it's like a bingo card with a load of numbers. Each number signifies an amount in token. If you tip that amount in, the, in tokens, it opens the, the number, the door of the number, and behind there is a sexual prize that the girls will perform. Now, a lot of those prizes, it's really weird things happen with this. So a lot of the prizes were quite funny. The first one was a firm handshake. That was 20 tokens, firm handshake, ha, ha, ha. They did a firm shake, yeah, like, really funny. Someone then came in and just tipped every single number in one go and then left the room again. <laughs> And the girls were like, oh my god, we've now got 15 sexually explicit acts to do immediately. <laughs> Why the hell did he do that? Well, this is the reason, because there's this huge culture of competition among the men to be the big guy on ta in town who is paying for everyone to get a free porn show. And they have leaderboards. So she has leaderboards of her favourite tippers, the people that tip the most. And the top of the leaderboard gets a prize at the... Business. She's thinking, how do I get them to compete with each other? Now, keynote board stuff was fun, but this was the weird thing about it. This was, she's so creative. She's always coming up with ways of like, making it interesting. So I'm sitting there. Now, before we started this whole show, she made me take a little picture of myself holding some identification because this was on Chatterbait, by the way, if anyone's interested in Chatterbait, it's called. The art, the, art, the art or the act of masturbating while chatting, chatterbait. And they're really strict, because they had a big spate of underage kids doing this. So they're like really quite worried. And so you, if anyone's likely to appear on the screen, you've got to have shown your ID beforehand. So she made me do it. And I said, why am I? I'm not appearing on the screen. Why are you making me do this? And she said, well, if you go to the toilet or whatever, and you might appear, it's really important. So I said, cool. So about two hours in, she looks over at me. So I'm still here, she's still there. Then she looks at the screen and says, guys, we've got a journalist with us today. And I was like, this was not part of the deal. Man. This was not part of the deal. <laughs> she's like, yeah, yeah. And he just said to me that if you agree to tip $100 in the next 90 seconds, he's going to come on screen and say hello. And I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> and sure enough, everyone's, t everyone's like tipped straight away. And then she comes over and grabs me and pulls me onto the bed. And so suddenly, there I am. And I was like, hello, everybody. So sorry. <laughs> and, uh, and then I leave. But someone screen grabbed it and sent it to me. So there you go. I got it on record. <laughs> so, so, yeah, I have. Um, now, by the end of the show, by the end of the show, they had made approximately three to four hundred pounds each in this show from those five thousand people. Now, why is that so popular? There's a, some really interesting research about how people are getting a bit turned off by ridiculous hardcore pornography because it doesn't actually in any way relate to or feel like the reality of what sex is like for most people. And there's a sort of huge amount of interest in this, which feels normal. It feels like a social event. And this, in a way, was part of the moral dilemma, which is that it's, 
it does feel like more a more healthy attitude to sex this type of this type of show and there are indeed cats running in and out and things go wrong and the webcam doesn't work for a second all that stuff that happens in real life actually if you're interested there is an amazing tumblr blog which is called Indifferent Cats in Amateur Porn. <laughs> I don't need to describe any more what it's like, but that's unbelievably funny, and I suggest you go and look at it on, not on your work computers. <laughs> and that's what it's like. It's realistic. It's actually realistic. And she, uh, Vex, she's earning something like £40,000 a year working one or two days a week. She loves it. She thinks it's an amazing job. Imagine if she was dancing in a bar or something, fucking awful. So she really loves it, but there is all the time underlying this, there was this kind of horrible dynamic that she is also terrified that the guys, and it is nearly all guys that are paying for this, can any second just go to another room. There's 30,000 other rooms, 30,000 other girls that will do what they want, and they could just tip her instead. So there's this sort of uneasy tension whereby they're constantly terrified that if they're not doing exactly what these people say, they can transfer their loyalty and their profession is immediately pulled out from under them. And so that left me feeling quite uneasy and I've had some people saying, this is brilliant, this is actually really good for the girls, it's really good for people watching pornography and others saying this is awful. It's even worse, it's just a money transaction. So, and I again, in the same way with the Silk Road, I left thinking, I'm not actually entirely sure what I think about this, whether I'm happy about this or worried or nervous about this. And indeed, you know, I ended up being screen grabbed. Who cares about that? But there are other people that get screen grabbed that do care an awful lot about it. Because once they're on the screen and someone grabs it, you can send it to anyone you want. And I've seen, and I did a chapter in the book about this as well, people that do webcamming and then have their lives utterly destroyed because someone grabs the images, and once it's out there, it's out there forever, and then just sends it to everyone they know. So there is, again, and what sometimes seems bad then feels good, then you think again and you worry and you're not sure. And that's how I left the webcam. Uh, the webcam chapter. And then the final thing is uh, neo-Nazis. Now, hmm. Oh yeah, that's great, thanks. There you go. Hmm. Gets me in the mood. Gets me in the mood. Well, it reminds me, because a lot of the chapter on neo-Nazis, I was in pubs drinking pints, so... <laughs> Makes me feel like I'm back there. So the, my favourite character in the whole book that I uh, met was a guy called Paul who was an unbelievably virulent neo-Nazi but I really liked him, I really liked him in person found him friendly and warm and charismatic and this isn't unusual, this is how it often goes but the difference here was that he had a radically different online persona to his offline persona so I'd been communicating with him for some time all online trying to get him to agree to meet up with me. You know, and he was, I mean, the stuff he was posting on Facebook and Twitter and YouTube was unbelievable. And I finally got him to agree to meet me, and I'm standing up, it's actually in Yorkshire again, so something going on in Yorkshire at the moment, I don't know what it is. <laughs> Jeffrey Boycott's got something to do. <laughs> but, um, and I'm standing, and he lives in a small town, and I'm waiting for him to turn up at this train station, and I'm shitting myself, because this guy is terrifying online, terrifying. And then this really, I mean, I'm sort of giving it away already, but this really sort of friendly, nice guy comes up and he goes, I can't believe you've come. I've seen you off the telly. You're Jamie from the telly. I'm so glad you're here. And I was like, oh, Jesus. Wasn't at all how I expected him. Sorry about that accent, everybody. <laughs> um, wasn't at all how I expected him to be. And I sort of wondered, how did he manage to create such a different online version of himself? And that was what I was trying to understand, what I was trying to work out. And it all started back in 2009 with the English Defence League. So I guess most of you will have come across the English Defence League, and I've done a lot of work on the English Defence League, spent a lot of time with Tommy Robinson, who was the leader of the English Defence League. Um, and... Back in 2009, this was the interesting thing about them. There's a bunch of lads from Luton, five or six of them, that's all, and they managed to start, thanks to Facebook, and it started as a Facebook group, not as an offline group, a Facebook group. They managed to start a movement 
whereby they were having 300, 400, 500, and then 1,000, then 2,000 people on the streets every other weekend marching up and down. Tommy Robinson appears on Newsnight with Jeremy Paxman. This was a Facebook group set up by five blokes in Luton. And this is the sort of interesting thing about the way politics is changing. Now, Paul, at that time, was only interested in clubbing and drugs. Didn't care about politics at all. Not interested. Then one of his mates, probably about 2011, one of his mates on Facebook liked the English Defence League's Facebook page. And this is the way he got into it. And it's the way so many people got into it. Because we don't trust politicians. We don't trust mainstream media. There's loads of surveys that show that. But we do trust our mates. So if our mate likes something on Facebook, we think, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll give that a go. So he clicked like on Facebook. And then suddenly he is receiving updates on his Facebook wall about the English Defence League. And he thinks, I like these guys. This, looks in this seems like quite interesting to me. So he went on to one demonstration, but he didn't like having all the people around. He's really quite a shy person. Didn't like it. But he started getting involved online a lot. So he started contributing to the page, started adding comments, started making posts of his own. And then one day after about six months, one of the administrators thinks, this guy, this Paul guy, he's really smart. He posts really interesting things. Let's invite him to become an administrator, an admin of our page. An admin of a page, this is unbelievable. Now it doesn't sound like much, but when you're living at home on your own and you're, you love this group and suddenly someone asks you to become a page admin, you can edit people's posts, you can kick people out, you put posts on yourself, this is amazing. And he really loved this. And I think this was one of the first times in his life he had a bit of power, a bit of authority. People were listening to him. And I think interestingly enough, the role of an admin is a really important one in politics today, but one that we don't really think about. Now, the person that was running the English Defence League's Twitter account when I was writing this book was a 16-year-old girl. A totally new type of person, not who you'd expect at all. 16-year-old girl. Now, when I did, uh, I did a big survey once of the British National Party's Facebook supporters, and I went to present the results, and it was about a survey of about 1,000 of them on Facebook, basically set up a little Facebook ad saying BNP supporters, click here to fill in a survey. And I targeted it at people that said they'd liked the BNP. And I didn't think anyone was going to reply and I got back like on Monday and a thousand of them had replied. I was like, this is amazing. So I went and presented it in the European Parliament and I sat down and Nick Griffin walked in and sat down in front of me. And I thought, oh my God. How much? So I presented it like straight faced and then afterwards he came up to me and said, Thank you so much, that was an amazing presentation. Because we had no idea who these people were either. <laughs> we don't know who they are. But we need them, because they're the guys now that are the ones that are getting out on the streets and doing demos. He said to me, I don't phone up a local party branch if I want a demo. I get someone to post it on the Facebook page. That's how we do it. So you've got this whole new category of people, and Paul was one of them. And he gets more and more into it. He spends more and more time on it. 90% of his day, he said, I was on f Facebook, I was, I was admining the page. And he gets more and more angry, he gets more and more frustrated, more and more polarised, because he's reading up about Islam, and everything he's reading about Islam comes from people that are posting stuff on the English Defence League page, which is not exactly the most sort of <laughs> objective account of the religion. So that's, but that's all he's reading, and that's all that's coming to him. So he's like, the country's being destroyed, Western civilization is on the verge of being over, Eurabia, they're taking over, all of this stuff. And he gets more and more and more angry and more and more frustrated. After a while, he decides... <laughs> That's, yeah, exactly. And that's the end. <laughs> After a while he decides, the English Defence League aren't radical enough for me anymore. They're not, they're, they're pretty tame. The BNP are rubbish, they're old, I don't like them. So he decides to start up his own type of nationalism, which he called New Nationalism, but spelled N-U, like New Metal. So it was sort of slick, well produced. Uh, and he just starts churning out propaganda, videos that he's learned how to make, high quality stuff. But he starts getting a following. People around the world are starting to listen to him. Now this is, and I was thinking, you know, and he's getting more and more angry, more and more caught in this little bubble of his own making. 
And I thought, where's this going to lead him? And one day he told me about a time when he's walking to the petrol station. It's always the petrol station, late at night, to get a sausage roll, whatever. And he, he's in this small town, remember, and three EDL people come walking towards him, wearing their gear, their sort of hoodies and chanting EDL. And I said to him, this is amazing, Paul. This must have been brilliant for you. Like, you actually finally managed to meet people like you in your small town. And he said, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I didn't talk to them, though. I said, what? why didn't you talk to them? He said, well, I was, I was too shy. I didn't know what to say. And I thought for a while, why, wh wh why was that? Why did he do that? And then I think I worked it out which is online, he is this virulent, respected, aggressive individual with respect, admiration, everyone's scared of him. He doesn't want people to know what he's really like, which is shy, timid, friendly, polite, unemployed, you know, living in this small town. That would just completely destroy his reputation. And so he gets all his affirmation from being this tough, brutal asshole. But he can't escape, he can't escape from that. Because if he leaves that identity behind, who is he? He's nobody. So he's like trapped in this world. And I worried, he disappeared. He disappeared after having spoken to him for weeks and weeks and weeks and met him a few times. He suddenly vanished. All his social media accounts disappeared and you couldn't get in touch with him, he'd gone. And I was thinking, oh my God, what's he done? Where's he gone? Because this is what happened to Anders Breivik. Anders Breivik was going through the same sort of journey as him and ended up sort of creating this filter bubble around himself and decided in the end that the only way to get to reclaim Western civilization was to go and kill a load of people. And he, as well, was very loud on social media, angry, chatting to everyone, and then suddenly went quiet. And that's a sign, and I thought, I wonder if... Paul, God, God forbid, he's going to go and do something really bad. And I was worried about it for a long time. And then suddenly, out of nowhere, he comes up again with a new pseudonym, gets in touch. And I say, what, where have you been? And he told me that what had happened was he'd become so angry, so he said he could feel his blood boiling, that he didn't trust himself anymore. He felt he was going to do something stupid. So he had to shut down all of his accounts, leave them all behind. But he'd returned again. But he'd created a new personality, and this time he'd created a woman, and this woman was going around under the sort of cover as a nice middle class, sort of white middle class um, home counties woman, and going on to Comment is Free and just like posting comments on Comment is Free <laughs> under the articles. Oh, I don't really agree with any of this, so I think this is. A... <laughs> and so he'd found an outlet. I mean, and so this was my dilemma with him, which was. I'm a real liberal. I think people have got to say what they think. Uh, even if it's really offensive, really upsetting and insulting, it's really important that people feel like they can. And I think social media has, for so many people, given them an outlet. Yeah, sure, sometimes it's really difficult to hear it, but it's great that people have that outlet, because when they don't, they can often get even more frustrated and more angry. The problem is, for some people, and I'd say Paul was on that line between going to where Anders Breivik ended up and going to somewhere a bit safer, where you get sucked in, you, get, you surround yourself with like-minded people. You only read articles that conform to or corrab corro corroborate your worldview. And that can just push you ever more into being convinced that the world is going to hell, country's gone to the dogs, whatever it is, and that the only answer is that you need to make some big kind of violent statement to shake it all up again. And that's the dilemma I face with him. And it wasn't an easy one. So look, I think I should stop there because that's been that's been 40 minutes or so, yeah. but this was this was the this was the this was the overarching the overarching message that I wanted to get across. I went into researching this book and it, all these dark subcultures, thinking I was going to find it very easy to decide what was bad and what was good, what was black and what was white, what was right and what was wrong. And every single chapter I did, <coughs> I came out thinking, I'm not actually sure. And almost every time, meeting the people in person really changed my view on it. Because they were always more interesting, always more morally nuanced, always more complex than the image I had of them in my head. And so there's always a danger that actually when things are hidden away, we also create demons in our, in our minds about how these people really are. So if there's one message to take away from it, it was that moral ambiguity 
and that was not at all what I expected to find on the dark net. Thank you for listening.